Imagine a place where the boundaries of age, industry, background, and culture melt away. Replaced by a shared desire to explore the depths of our collective experiences, here on the open, shaded porch. Amidst an atmosphere of serenity and tranquility, leaders from all walks of life gather to share their stories, the stories that shape their very beings and doings. This is the Knowledge Mindfulness Porch with Layla Maru. Joining me on the porch this week are two inspiring leaders who are reshaping the investment landscape with their vision and expertise. Jasmine Bousson took the leap to found Globivest in 2016, building a pioneering venture capital firm that proves impact and profit can go together. Alongside her is neuroscientist, professor, and partner, Dr. Laura Joy Bulos. As Globivest chief health officer, she brings an unparalleled interdisciplinary perspective to investing in health tech innovation. Her research uses algorithmic approaches to understand decision-making processes in times of turmoil and uncertainty. Laura Joy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having us, Leila. Jasmine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Leila. It's a pleasure being here and nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So allow me to start with your thesis. I thought that was a very interesting point. Your thesis of One Health, which really translates into supporting companies that target both healthy humans and healthy environment. Wow. I mean, that just like strikes a chord with me because of this interconnection between healthy humans and healthy environment. Let's start with you, Laura Jor, with the background of you being the partner and chief health officer. So tell me a little bit about the word healthy. How do you define healthy here when you say the interconnection between healthy humans and healthy environment? Leila, you're starting off with a huge question. Uh, and I think, I think it's, uh, it, it sets the tone for this podcast. I'm excited. Um, maybe one thing that we can start with, and I'm sure Jasmine would agree, is that what is majorly new with this One Health approach is that we at Globivest are bringing it to the investment table, to the VC world, because the One Health thesis is, uh, is WHO thesis, so it's uh, the World Health Organization's thesis that uh, exactly, as you said, wants to show how healthy humans, healthy environments, and healthy animals, these three verticals, are closely intertwined. What we're doing with Globivest, with our VC fund, that I'm sure Jasmine will tell you more about in a bit, is to say that our investments in early stage startups can also try to make sense out of th these different sectors that often do not uh, seem uh, connected or are, at least are not obviously connected. Now, to go back to your question, to your huge <laughs> question of what healthy means, I would say I would say there is not there is no one definition of what health is or is supposed to be. But what is certain is that it's there is some care that should be that should be brought to the health, to to this term. So what I mean in a way is that if we want to be healthy, there's some uh, intention there. We should care for our health. We should care for our environment's health. We should ask the question of exactly the way you asked. You asked it of what it means for us to be healthy as individuals, for people around us to be healthy. Um, I mean, for for one person, it could be uh, to to eat uh, three apples a day. For another one, it could be to do one hour of sports. For another one, and all the, of these are obviously preventive measures. And the same goes for the environment. There's not one answer. The Mediterranean basin that I'm very much interested in. Is has one set of rules, and then I don't know. I, I guess the tropics, the Amazons have another set of rules. But the idea is to care for this environment and to care for our own health as individuals, and to also care about the link uh, between these two different environments and these two different sets of rules uh, around the environment. Wonderful, wonderful. So Jasmine, going back to Globivest, of course, we want to start from the beginning. 
the beginning means that drive that you have, that deep drive to support the tech-driven innovation that really combines these two ideas together and really believes in that. Where does that passion, where does that drive come from? What, can you tell us a little bit about the start of all this? Absolutely, Leila. Uh, I think it's important to note that um, I was born and raised in Lebanon. Uh, my father was French. My mother is Lebanese. So I always had a mix of different cultures. Uh, and I was always a bit, you know, a bit uh, shocked by the injustice we were facing here as a country uh, in terms of security, social uh, um, justice, social help, governmental uh, aspect as well. And I thought to myself, when I look at Europe or the US, not that they do not have uh, some problems as well. I was like, if some instances here in the region and especially Lebanon are not trying to provide just simple care to its population, maybe we can try and do that with technology, whether it touches agriculture, education, health, um, financial services. So I think I was always a very curious per person, passionate, uh, passionate about people. And I thought to myself, it could be a good way, you know, to start and support brilliant entrepreneurs who are really trying to make things matter and add disruption to a problem, a country, whether on individual aspect or more largely on, on a societal aspect as well. So it, I guess it all started from there. Um, back in 2016, we started as a family office with a VC-focused portfolio. And I always had the term impact in the back of my mind. But as we all know, impact is, is quite an umbrella term. Like, what does it mean, you know? So I guess um, myself with Laura Joy joining in 2018, we really wanted to understand what impact we could bring with technology um, to the world. And uh, we started defining our thesis more and more. Uh, we decided to cap the family office fund end of 2022 and um, decided to come up with um, this One Health thesis. And we're very proud to say that we're the first woman-led fund in the MENA region with a One Health approach. And hopefully we'll have more actors from the region follow this path because it's true we're in a very capitalistic environment but um, you know generating returns is not opposite to creating impact as well so we're also trying to look at this from I would say another approach and also growing up as a woman in the MENA region um, has really put an importance for us to really support underrepresented founders uh, LGBTQ plus community, uh, underprivileged people, and really try to offer as many chances uh, to talented entrepreneurs. That's wonderful to hear, Jasmine, really. But I'm very curious, before I dig into all the things you've said, I just want to start with uh, knowing a little bit more about this partnership with you and Laura Joy. How did it start? I mean, where did you meet? How did it, you know, materialize? Basically, Leila, I met personally Laura Joy a few years back. And uh, the, one of the first questions I asked her, obviously, after meeting her is, what do you do in life? And she's like, I'm a neuroscientist. And I'm like, neuroscientist? What's that? It's fascinating. So I started to discover the brain through Laura Joy, through... Uh, uh, her, her teaching, she'll tell you a bit more about this. And I really thought to myself that with the, this family office fund, if we want to start creating some impact, it should definitely start with uh, healthy humans and, and life science in general, and especially um, supporting women in science. And Laura Joy can tell you more about that, but I was shocked to hear, for example, that most of lab research uh, is done on male mice and not female, you know? So not taking the female body in consideration when it comes to studies, uh, uh, pharmaceutical, clinical phases, and so on, was something that really shocked me. 
So I asked Laura Joy very openly to start and building a life science portfolio. And I think it really adds lots of richness uh, to what we're doing today. And I would love for Laura Joy to continue and give you uh, more context. And uh, yeah. I just want to ask you before that is, what do you think are the perfect ingredients for a healthy partnership, borrowing your <laughs> word of health? I think one thing that is key in any type of partnership, but really any type, is communication, is being clear from the beginning that each individuals uh, and entities that are a part of the partnership um, express what they're looking to get and to give out of and to this partnership and to check throughout the project, throughout the deployment of the, of the different KPIs to constantly check with the other partner or partners that the alignment is still there. Really communication is key. I think it doesn't mean that we, that two or more partners have to talk constantly, but it means that they have to make sure that the communication means or that the means of communication are, are there. Uh, to be used at different time points, let's say regularly. You know, I, I also think it, it's it's what um, it's what makes our partnership at Globivest and specifically Jasmine and I, the rest of the team as well, and specifically Jasmine and I, um, we're very close personally, and we're we we work constantly, almost constantly together. So it's yeah, it's constant checks about how the other is doing, how the other is moving with their own objectives, uh, how they're feeling as well. Uh, it's, it's sort of em embracing the whole thing, but without making a, a huge thing out of it as well, because you know, you have to work, so you can't constantly, you can't let it get used too much space, but you have to make sure that when there's something important to talk about, there's time and space that is made for it. Do you think being open to each other's perspectives, Jasmine, uh, plays a role too? Absolutely. And I think another point um, that is important to take into consideration is agreeing on certain values and terms and making sure we stick to the vision we have at the end of the day. And sometimes, you know, it's challenging. Laura Jai and I might not agree on everything, but I think what makes it interesting is the fact that we're being, being challenged. Um, I think we're a bit stubborn, Laura Joy and I. So coming back, you know, with facts and checks and being able to convince one another about a certain idea is what personally makes me, you know, want to dig more, be a bit more curious, have more depth to the studies we make, the due diligence, the any topics we may have. So yeah. That's a very, very interesting point, because what you're saying is that maybe sometimes if we have people who agree with us all the time, they cannot uh, make us grow. I mean, decisions have to be made uh, based on what uh, are you going to look at things with your narrow perception? You know, as individuals, we see things in our nar narrow window and framework. So having a partner like Laura Joy with you, I think that expands that window in many ways. And I think that's wonderful, really, really wonderful. To find those ingredients is, I think, a magic. Magic happens when you find that partner. So going back a little bit to the whole talk about women and women-led VCs, because I felt that this is something that you so much touched upon in the last few minutes. And can you tell me more about what are the challenges as a VC, you know, founder, as a partner, as a woman in that kind of field? What are the challenges that you are facing right now, Jasmine? There are many challenges, um, but that doesn't mean, mean it doesn't make it interesting to say the least. On the contrary, it makes you, you know, want to break barriers and fight even more. I think being a woman is at first a challenge, and then it depends on the region you are. Uh, I think in Europe and in, U in the US, it's a bit different than in the MENA region, but we're getting there. And, you know, we have to keep on evolving uh, in that matter. Um, 
we we heard like you know when we started uh, Globivest Fund Two uh, and decided to have uh, an institutional fund. I looked at Laura Joy and I was like, "We're going to make it. We're going to have a first close in a couple of months because we do have the track record. We worked a lot for it, and there's no reason, you know, why investors would support men more than women um, as long as it's based on facts and and success." And Laura Joy looked at me and she has a bit more to share on that matter. Um, and she was like, you know, it's going to be challenging because we're women. And I was like, yeah, sure. But to what extent? And I think I really realized how challenging it was to be viewed and to have this position of being at the head of a fund as, as women, because we might come to investors have absolutely everything they need and showcase a great track record. And we would still have questions like, yeah, but where's the man in the team? Or where's the man in the room, you know? Um, and when you face such questions, I mean, personally, it makes me laugh and want to come back to them later and say, man or woman, it's, um, it's just a ridiculous point of view, unfortunately. And, you know, try to make mentalities grow a bit in this region is definitely one of the purpose of Globivest Fund 2, for sure. Laura Joy, when it comes to men and women in terms of decision makings, in terms of money, in terms, what is with your background in neuroscience, what is the difference really between men and women in terms of decision makings, especially to do with money, where uh, Jasmine is talking about where's the men in the room or can we trust a woman? Where does this come from in terms of neuroscience, the brain, decision making? I know this is also your background and kind of your focus in research. So I'd love to hear more about that. It's, it's a very interesting question, Leila. There's, you know, there is, um, for, for a long while, um, people, scientists, neuroscientists specifically, try to uh, sort of put a gender on the brain and say, uh, you know, there are these some parts of the brain that are stronger, or weaker, or more functional, less functional, more correlated, more connective, etc., cetera, um, in women or in men brain. I think a couple of things. First, gender is, we, we, we are stepping into a world with, with the new generation, with the Gen Z, in a world where gender is uh, is more fluid, is less binary, and I think it's something there. It's something that is interesting, and also obviously it comes with resistance from some of us of the older generation. Um, but I think there's one thing that is interesting about it is is everything that is about deconstructing every social construct and trying to understand when there is a difference in decision-making, for instance, between men and women, is it a biological difference or is it a difference that came with responsibilities, with roles in, in society for, societies for all these centuries? And is it something that today with, uh, with, uh, with well, the fact that we are three women around the table being professional, look at us, all the three of us, is it something that is still valid today or is it something that is changing? Um, and do we want it to change, basically? Uh, so the, the first thing that I would say is that, yeah, for instance, usually uh, we say that men are more risk takers. We say, and there are a couple of papers there, if you look on PubMed, on on search engine, on scientific search engines, you could find papers telling you that women w w tend to include their emotions a bit more in their decision making. I would argue against it that first, it's a social construct that is most probably a social construct or at worst, some epigenetics that are about to change fairly quickly. And the other thing is that most of the time, whether it's men of or women or anyone at uh, sort of positions of, of executive positions or decision-making positions with some power, most of the time we look at profiles that are way more similar um, than the differences between genders. I mean, if a CEO, whether it's a man or a woman, are, tend to be more to have uh, more traits in common on their decision-making profile, for instance, than uh, an alumni employee that is that did not want not not that did not reach, but did not want to take these types of responsibilities, perhaps with other um, even more valuable skills or not. I don't know, but but 
I do think that um, most of the differences in decision-making profiles are bound to, to get smaller between genders. And what could remain is potentially linked to, uh, to hormonal changes and cycles, probably, in, in biological women, at least. And I think it's something that we should embrace, and not just as individuals, but systematically, uh, at a systemic scale, try to see how to include these differences that are more often than not, and most of the time, valuable, something that we want to bring to the table, but just find a way to include it, because obviously they're not part of the parameters that were set by I don't want to use cliche terms like patriarchal societies, but at least by businesses run by men. You know, Laura Joy, I just don't know why, but I have this always vision. I'm I'm such an integrative thinker. So for me, you know, when I read about the thesis, about this interconnection between human health, environmental health, I always think of each one women, men, they have, like you said, their strength the biology, the whatever comes into that picture, that sometimes I ask myself, isn't it better if we work together, kind of complementing each other's <laughs> characteristics, strength, and all that? It's not a competition at the end of the day. So I don't know. What do you think, Laura Joy? What do you think, Jasmine, about this? Do you ever think, okay, let's include a man's perspective on this and see if the decision would be stronger, not because he's a man or she's a woman, because that integration of the strength of both men and women, they come together to bring more on the table than man alone, a woman alone. What do you think of that? Leila, that's music to my ears. I mean, I hope we'll be able to achieve, you know, um, that that fluent aspect and just not have, you know, gender biases when you talk to a person. And And to be completely honest, I grew up in a family where being a man or a woman was never a question. And it took me time to realize that, unfortunately, uh, it's not us, us three here uh, talking together that are putting these barriers, but it's more resistance coming from outside. And I wish this resistance was not there and, you know, was just not that present. But unfortunately, when you see every day or hear stories about injustice, about being putting, be, women being uh, put aside because of gender, not giving them enough responsibilities. Um, you know, men tend also, not all of them, of course not. And for example, at Globivest, we're very lucky to have as uh, our legal counsel, Charbel Marbes, who's uh, an exceptional human being. But I tend to say that unfortunately, most of the time, it's not the case. And I wish we could achieve that, you know, what you just mentioned, being able to speak as humans, bring our differences, whether it's being a man or a woman or someone a bit more stubborn or someone who takes a bit more time or someone who's faster or, and just have all of these differences put together to, yeah, have more strength. Yes, we would love to see that in the world. Kind of, you know, like you said, all these walls coming down and bridging, building bridges between genders, age groups, you know, all that is, I, I don't know, but I think in the knowledge mindfulness arena, we, I just, we believe so much in that integration in th that we are stronger together, no matter within age groups, within genders and within cultures and all that. You're absolutely right, Leila, and I was going to add on what Jasmine said. Just, just the fact that it's it's always difficult to to accept the fact that some of us, and sometimes it comes from a position of privilege, some of us know what we want for others, for us, for the world, and whether it's diversity, integration of the diversity, and to sort of be aware of all the steps that separate us from the reality today to this ideal scenario and to be okay with taking steps that are not ideal meanwhile to get there. And one example is, that I have in mind is that I was, I was lucky to get this um, L'Oréal UNESCO award for women in science. And for me, it was just an award that starts, but then I realized that it was a network of women in science asking always all these right questions that should be asked. And one of the main debates among us 
has always been, or has been for the past few years, this question of do we want to put quotas to have a certain number of women in uh, in a committee? In a and obviously, ideally, the answer is no. Like we wouldn't want to we wouldn't want to be part of something of a board or a committee or a discussion because we are women and we are feeling a sort of uh, just ticking a box. Um, and also, we we don't think it's fair. But also, at the same time. As long as women are not as much part of the conversation as men are, we need to take certain measures that are not ideal. It makes sense. It makes sense what you're saying. I think really what I'm thinking about right now is how difficult is it for both of you when you make decisions to do with investing in startups? That link between the tangible and the intangible, between monetary gains and impact. You know, I was reading in your CVs and all that, and I was thinking, it's so hard to evaluate and measure intangibles like impact, for instance. So how do you do it? How do you do it, Jasmine, in terms of what is the criteria when it comes to evaluating impact when deciding on, you know, where to invest, what to invest in? The first, I definitely agree. This quantification of the intangible is is uh, fairly challenging, especially given the fact that is cars. It hasn't been done um, that much um, globally. One thing that we did is to we built a, a framework, an impact framework, where we put five categories, and for each category, we have subcategories, and we're scoring. We're putting scores exactly the way we would uh, we would put a score on a business plan or on. Uh, fi a financial plan, a business model, etc. Et we're putting a score on each of these different um, indicators, let's call them, of the framework. And to to design this framework, we used an, we used other um, grids and frameworks such as the the sustainable goals of the UN, the SDGs, the sustainable development goals, the 17 SDGs. We use a few other scales to design this framework. So this is number one, is really to design a framework and then to test it and and get back to it iteratively and to, to just uh, improve it, let's say. And the number two element that is important uh, beyond, I would say, or, or before measuring, I'm not sure, is the fact that people always say, isn't it hard to combine impact and returns? But at the end of the day, eventually they're both very much linked. They're almost the same because if, if you really want to build a solution that is going to last, not just be a trend that gets you capitalistic returns and then disappear when it's not the trend anymore, but at, or where you're pushing a behavior, no, where you're actually looking for how to solve an existing problem. And we all know how many like, problems exist. We don't need to invent them, but they're just right there outside the window. So it's like to open the window and take a look at the problems and say, okay, which solution can be the most sustainable to solve this problem and, and its uh, future potential developments. And in that sense, if you manage to solve a problem, so you have an impact, uh, the return is normally if the business plan is aligned and the numbers are aligned, well, the return is supposed to be massive as well. So it's really to, to remind the fact, to remind people and, and investors, co-investors working with us uh, of the importance of of, of that, of the fact that you don't have to invent a tool and invent a problem to do interesting monetary returns. Jasmine, I don't know if you want to add on that, maybe. Yeah, I think what I would like to say, if I take more a macro look at um, impact in general and how the world functions today, for example, charity is very important and we absolutely need it, especially in underprivileged countries. But ideally, if we go back to this concept of what should be ideal, uh, sustainability for me is the key to the solution to many, many problems. And as Rajoy was saying, if we're trying, to, for example, to find a, a drug development for a certain uh, uh, brain disease, or if we're trying, you know, to fight uh, climate change or uh, bring uh, some financial inclusion to underprivileged people, it does not mean these companies should not generate millions, hundreds of millions of, of profits and revenue every year. And we should push towards that, trying to really 
move away from what seems to be shallow and not actually bringing something tangible to the society and on the contrary, trying to concentrate on real life problems while generating return. And we should not feel ashamed of that. It's good money should bring impact and good profits to investors who also took the risk uh, to invest in early stage startups and entrepreneurs. I really think Jasmine and Laura Joy, I think whatever, whatever you're doing right now really resonates not only with me, with a lot of even the younger generation that is really believing in social responsibility and the environment and all that. And it's just really very heartwarming to hear that this is done in action by both of you. I mean, even when writing the book of Knowledge Mindfulness, having the framework around all the things that you're talking about and seeing that in action, I mean, wow, that is something that I think both of you should be very proud of. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about the stories in the coming years of the success of combining those two, being the norm and not the exception. And that brings us to the point where we must stop. Coming up next time on Knowledge Mindfulness Porch with Globovist Jasmine Bousson and Laura Joy Boulos, Jasmine will talk about the culture they've built at their private investment firm. I think it's really being true to ourselves as first and then to founders and try to keep our promise. You have been listening to the Knowledge Mindfulness Porch with Layla Marouf. If you want to join the movement of knowledge mindfulness and shape the world of tomorrow, go to drlaylamaroof.com. The Knowledge Mindfulness Porch is a production of Forbes Books.